Today I'm sharing a different kind of interview than what I usually do on this channel. I have my good friend Nasser who I uh, sat down with, had a conversation, and he shared his story about how he came out of being a radical, devoted, uh, zealous Muslim who grew up in Saudi Arabia to now he is a, a follower of Jesus. Um, something very significant had to happen in his life to change his mind. Nasser was, again, a very devoted Muslim, zealous, passionate, convinced that that was the truth, convinced that Christians who taught that, you know, Jesus died on a cross, that Jesus was God, things like that, was convinced that that was blasphemous and, and that it was ridiculous. But something happened that changed his mind. Something in his life happened that convinced him that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so he's going to share the story of how that happened um, in this conversation. Um, Nasser is also a very good Bible teacher. I think God has given him a gift for teaching. And being that he grew up in Saudi Arabia, he offers, I think, a unique Middle Eastern uh, perspective and approach to the scriptures that I think for us who live in the West, some of some of the things, some of the context in the Bible, some of the relational aspects, especially you know in the Old Testament, there's things that come across as weird to us that I think to those who grow up in the Middle East, they have a a better perspective, a better understanding about those things. They can relate to it more um, because it's much closer to home. And so Nasser, I think, has that unique perspective to offer on the scriptures. Many of you over the past year or so have asked me for recommendations on on Bible teachers. And, and, you know, places that you might go to as a resource if you want to continue um, a relationship with the Bible, especially those of you who uh, many of you following this channel are coming out or have experienced in some way the World Mission Society Church of God cult. You're coming out of that. You're kind of looking for some new direction. And uh, this is just one guy that I would recommend you you would go to and follow as a I think he's a good resource for you guys um, looking for that. And so you can find his YouTube channel. I'll put a, um, a link to that in the description of this video. And, uh, and so with that said, um, yeah, I hope that uh, this story blesses you as it does me um, every time that I hear it. One Sunday he was preaching on, preaching a message, and he was talking about the cross. And so I just immediately checked out. I found the cross so offensive as a Muslim. I didn't like to, to talk about it. I didn't like to think about it. Um, but I just felt something stir in me, you know, um, like what, what if it was true? What if somehow like these Christians think that what Jesus, that Jesus being crucified somehow makes all the difference in the world for them and for their lives. And so what if there is something to that? And I just don't understand. It. Um, and, and what if that something was going to make all the difference for me and my remember at this point like i'm pretty sure i'm going to hell uh and and what if there's something about in that story that's relevant to my situation well nasser thank you so much for joining us today we've been talking about doing this for a while and uh I'm excited to get you on to, to share your story. Well, I am very excited to finally be doing this. I think we've talked about this for months. <laughs> yes. Good. It's finally right. happening. Yeah, I, I have several people like that that I that I, you know, I'll talk about doing these interviews and it, you know, three or four months later I'm like, okay, let's go. So it's just kind of the way it works right now. But um, you know, as I was thinking about this. You telling your story, I just thought of Psalm 107, 1 through 3, that I think might kind of set the trajectory for for at least part of what we're going to be talking about. So it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Uh, so that part where he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Like if you've been redeemed by the Lord, then say so. Like yeah. it's saying like, talk about it, tell people about it. Don't right. keep it bottled in. Let it, let it be known because there's other people who, who need that hope. There's other people who need to redemption. have a similar story of redemption happen in their lives. So absolutely. Absolutely.
So, um, so today Nasser is going to share some of his story. And um, I know that a, a lot of people that follow this channel, as we talked about, are coming out of a specific cult group, the World Mission Society Church of God. Right. And as I was listening to you share your testimony uh, in another interview this week, um, it just hit me how many similarities there are between your experiences within Islam um, sure. and and uh, so many of these people who have come out of this cult. And I think it's not just this specific cult, but any cult. Sure. Um and so, so I think as Nasser shares his story, um, Nasser is a former, uh, how would you, how would you describe what you formerly were? I guess I'll let you do I was that. Muslim, right? But then Islam has, uh, a, it's, it's a big enough house that it has a few different rooms in it. And so I, I was from the, the subsection of Islam, um, the, the bigger subsection of Sunni Islam, um, which is sort of traditional Islam. And then within that, the subsection of um, Salafi um, Islam, which is sort of the flavor that's uh, primarily practiced um, in and around Saudi Arabia, which is where I grew up. Okay. And you were, you were uh, quite militant in your religion, right? Oh yeah, that tends to be a hallmark of uh, Salafi. That that's that particular sect of Islam because the 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 root the word go, means um, it's it's a abbreviation of Salaf as Salih, um, which means like the 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 pious or the righteous um, ancestors or predecessors. And so the idea it's sort of like Islam taken back to its roots, to its sort of like fundamental Islam, if you will. And so it's that idea of like, we want to, we want to live as Muslims, um, modeling our lives as close as possible to that first generation um, of the followers of um, Muhammad, who's the prophet of Islam. So we're like, that's going back 1400 years. So we're trying to have that, that same mentality and, and lifestyle of people 1400 years ago um, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and, and for me, I was, I was available for jihad in all its forms. That, that was my upbringing is like, if I got to go on a battle, some foreign battlefield somewhere and kill people in order to defend what I think are the rights of my Muslim brothers and sisters, I'm willing to do that. Um, whether that means going to Afghanistan, um, whether that would have meant like in the nineties, um, you know, going into the former Yugoslavia, wherever that might be, I was willing to go and do that. So you were a former Muslim, very passionate, very committed. Yeah. And obviously what, what, what we know is that now you're not, now you are a follower right. of Jesus. And there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between that, sure. um, that took, that took something very significant and powerful in your life to cause that to happen. Yeah. But, um, before we, we talk about that part of your story, um, maybe go back to your childhood and maybe just kind of paint a picture for, for people. Cause again, you grew up in Saudi Arabia, a much right. different setting, much different culture than what many of us are used to much different setting than you're in now. And so paint a picture of what that was like. What was it like growing up? Uh, and I guess, I guess primarily with that, like how did that influence and, and mode or, or, Influence your your way of thinking about about religion and about God, right. your your upbringing with your parents. How did that all kind of play into that? What well, was very it was spiritually homogenous in a way that I think few people that have grown up in the West, particularly in the U.S., which is such a melting pot. I think few people here can really understand what that looks like. The idea that that pretty much, I mean, like ninety nine point nine nine percent of the people around you believe exactly the same things you do, have been taught exactly the same things. Um, you know, maybe not everyone is a, takes it all as seriously as, as another person does. But, you know, that there's no, there's no question about what the truth is when it comes to religious matters. Like it's already been decided for you. It's been handed down to you. Your job is to believe it. Um, the things that you're obligated to do based on those beliefs to do those things. And, and that's just it. And so, 
um, you know, I, I would use the phrase echo chamber uh, to, to describe, you know, what growing up in that kind of environment looks like, because it's just everywhere you go, it's just the same message just being broadcast everywhere. I mean, literally, um, in some cases, broadcast um, in towards you and, and at you and every every part of your life, whether it's school, work life, uh, you know, out in the street, whatever, you're just being bombarded um, by this um, singular message over and over and over again. So your parents were Muslim as well. And did they, well, but I think in your story, you were, you talked about how you were more, maybe more zealous in, in some sure. ways than more uh, than the other members of your family. Yeah. I'm the firstborn. And so, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, competitive spirit maybe that comes, comes with that. Right. And so I was always wanting to outdo, you know, um, my younger brothers and, and just, you know, being more zealous, more knowledgeable, um, in spiritual matters. Um, I was I carried over into school. So, um, this is another thing I think few people in the West can, can relate to, um, almost every single class I had in school has some sort of religious foundation to it. Even like science classes, like we would learn things about biology, and then in, in, embedded in that lesson would be some verses from the Quran or something that Muhammad said that sort of validated what we were learning. Almost as if like this thing that the nature that we observe is true because God said this already, you know, to Muhammad 1400 years ago. And so we should not be surprised that that's exactly what we find in nature. So like religion is just worked into everything. And then we would have, you know, um, whole, you know, subjects in school that were just focused on particular doctrines. So, and I'm talking, in case you're imagining like, oh, like in high school, right? No, I'm talking all the way back in first grade. We're taking classes on um, understanding the, the vocabulary of, of sixth century Arabic so that we can understand the Quran. Um, we are, are studying particular doctrines that there's a doctrine to which is the oneness of God. Like we were, we're studying that stuff in first, second, third grade, spending an hour, you know, on that, you know, three days a week or whatever. Um, and it was just, it was just wrapped up in everything. And, and I wanted it to be the best in school. I wanted to have the highest grades in my class. And so I just went after all this stuff and just soaking all this in. And, uh, and I took it all very, very seriously, much, to a much greater extent than, than most of my peers. So you were, you were really pushed to, in, in basically all aspects of your life to embrace this, this religion that, that, and that played into the kind of person that you became. So maybe tell us like what, oh, yeah. looking back now, thinking back to the person that you were, um, before Christ, maybe kind of talk about that. Talk about the kind of person that all this sort of upbringing, all this influence caused you to, to be. Well, you know, the, the message of Islam is very simple. If you will submit your life to God and do the things that he requires of you and avoid the things that he has forbidden to you, um, then when you are judged on the last day, it, if you've been more obedient than disobedient, you will you have a good chance, we'll say that, of being rewarded with, uh, you know, an eternity in paradise. Um, commiserate, commiserate with, you know, how, how well you did. Um, in other words, if you did really, really well, you'll have a nicer afterlife, if you will, than someone who just kind of barely scraped by. And, and so, you know, that to me, I, I wasn't dumb. I understood that mean I, I needed to really take this stuff seriously. If I wanted to have a nice eternity, then I needed to do, I needed to first of all know what all the right things I need to do are. I need to know the things I need to avoid. And then I have to just work my hardest to do all these right things and avoid all these wrong things. And Islam isn't, it's a very involved um, religious system. It's not just about you know, going, going to your church or, you know, place of worship once a week. And I mean, you're, right. you're you are um, called to prayer from your local mosque in your neighborhood um, audibly five times a day. There's five specific times where 
Muslims are encouraged to stop, drop everything you're doing, and you're going to go and you're going to pray. And you can't even just walk in, you know, pray like wherever you are. You need to um, ritually wash yourself so that you're cleansed physically before God. And then, you know, when you pray, you don't just say whatever you want. Like there's um, specific uh, body postures you take in specific order in prayer. Mm -hmm. There's there's specific things you're supposed to recite either out loud or quietly to yourself in each, uh, you know, posture position you take in the prayer. It's very formal. It's very um, predefined for you. And, and you've got to walk through these rituals every single day. And that's just prayer. That doesn't even get into fasting. Um, it doesn't get into, you know, the 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 memorization and uh, you know, ability to recite as much of the Quran as you can manage. And that's that's super, um, you know, promoted and, and pushed on people like it's you're, you're a better Muslim, the more of the Quran you've sort of hidden in your heart. Um, and that you can recite um, on command and and just like every area of your life, how, how, how you spend your money, how you um, conduct your rela the relationships in your life, everything from spouses to parenting to the, your, your obligation to the, your larger, you know, extended family, all like Islam has something to say about every, every aspect of your life. Um, and so it could be quite overwhelming to try to stay within the boundary lines of what's mm. permitted um, all the time. And so you're constantly being aware, okay, I did really well here. Oh, kind of messed up here. And so what that looked like for me being something of a, of a perfectionist by personality, you know, by nature, like I just stressed over this stuff and wanting to do the right thing. Like it just can, like I, my mind was just always focused on, um, doing the right, what I thought was the right things all the time. And, and when I looked, and you can't help but do this when you're in this kind of system, you kind of look and, and notice how other people seem to be doing, how they seem to be handling sort of the pressures or the burdens. And I noticed that it seemed as if, you know, most of my peers, number one, they didn't take this stuff as seriously as I did. Um, and number two, they didn't seem to care too much. Like I didn't seem to think about it too much. Um, uh, you know, Middle Eastern culture in general tends to be pretty laid back. And so it was just kind of this almost fatalistic attitude, uh, you know, just kind of living in the moment. Um, I'll worry about that later. Um, you know, if God, if God has predestined me for, for heaven or hell, what can I do anyway? So I'm just going to go with the flow. Um, yeah, I'd there's see a that kind of attitude. With you. <laughs> What's that? There's all, there's a whole other video there we could, we could do. Right. Oh yeah. Someday. Right. So, <laughs> but I was just like, eh, you know, maybe, maybe God has predestined me for heaven or hell already. I don't know. So I'm going to do my best um, to try to prove to him why I deserve to be in the good place and not the bad place. And, uh, and so I did that just in, in everything and all my practices and seeing that I felt like I was better than everyone else. So then like the, the pride starts to creep in and you start to sort of get this inflated um, ego and I, and uh, a sense of your own righteousness and holiness and look how much better I am than everyone else. And why is it that I have to remind all my friends, guys, it's like, it's time to pray. Like we got to stop the soccer game and we need to go pray now and not put it off. Like, don't be lazy. Like this is for God. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I took, I started to take a lot of pride in it. It became more than just, uh, you know, earning my, my salvation or, or earning approval from God, but also came about sort of proving that, um, I had this down, like I could do this, I could live this life and I could do it as well as if not better than, you know, most of the people that I was interacting with, um, you know, who were Muslims. That. <clears throat> Yeah, that sounds very familiar in so many ways, um, as, as it did the, the past times I've heard your testimony. And, and when I say familiar, obviously I'm referring again to, to this specific cult group, the World and Society Church of God that we're commonly dealing with. But it's not just, I'm not just pointing my finger at that group or, or Islam. And this is this, yeah, this is the condition, right? Of the, this is what human beings naturally will do when right. they are. Uh, trying to do religion apart from the spirit of God, that this is, this is what is produced. It's, it's, you know, yeah. it goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? Like you're talking about all these, these works and this burden that you felt. And I know in your story, all this led to 
eventually like this, this guilt and this fear almost of, of hell, um, this fear that you weren't doing enough. And, um, and, and all that reminds me again of, of Genesis, Adam and Eve's sin. And what they did is they went and sewed fig leaves together and they tried to cover themselves up. Right. Well, and, we can and, fix this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can fix it. And, and it produced fear, like, like rather yeah. than being confident and free in who they were before God, they hid in shame and fear. And, right. and as they were separating themselves from God, they were trying to, to cover themselves. They're trying to do something that God right. wanted to do for them. And so, um, so, that uh, that sounds exhausting to me. That that sort of life, um, and, and I've certainly tasted of it. I think any believer can slip into to sort of totally moments of, of that sort of mentality of, of of works. But in essence, that was a a works based mentality that was really driving oh, everything you did. Absolutely. So. Was there a lot of uh, like fear of hell involved in that? Um, I guess maybe maybe tell us like how how did that sort of mentality eventually affect you? What did it ultimately uh, uh, push you toward? I, I remember again in your in your story before, as I've heard it, it seemed like there was a lot of fear that started to come in, guilt, and just a lack of assurance. Right. That that didn't come in until later. Um, mostly because I felt like as much as it depended on me, I was, I was doing the right things all the time. Right. And so, you know, every year during uh, the month of Ramadan, you know, I, I was fasting every day, never missed my fasts, um, uh, never cheated. <laughs> um, I, you know, was, was always made, uh, uh, not missing my prayer time and I did my five daily prayer times. I made that a priority in my life. I was able, and, as, and as long as I was able to keep these things up, it sort of created a sort of self-assurance. Like I don't have to worry too much about, I mean, obviously God can do whatever he wants. Um, you know, as a Muslim, I believe that God is, is sovereign to the point that even if I feel like, you know, my, my good deeds outweigh my bad, God can still choose for whatever reason he wants to still throw me to hell. And that's okay. Like in Islam, that's totally fine. Like God's not mm -hmm. bound to anything. Um, and so, but, you know, I thought, yeah, you know, I feel okay. I feel like I'm doing all right. It wasn't until honestly that, you know, I got, came, had come to the U S, um, as a young teenager, uh, got stuck here because of the first Gulf war kind of sort of landed in this role of, of feeling like a Muslim missionary <laughs> to the Midwestern, you know, America. And, you know, trying to lead Americans to become Muslim, um, recruiting them, you know, if you will, um, into Islam and, and then got married um, to my wife who came from a Christian background, but pretty sure that since I'd converted others, I could convert her. And then that wasn't working out. Um, she, for some reason, just didn't want to deny Jesus as Savior and Lord. And I couldn't mm -hmm. understand why. Uh, yeah. But what uh, after the initial, you know, early months of our marriage and she realized that like she was never gonna like through any kind of apologetic or arguing human argument was going to be able to sway me from from beliefs that i held so strongly and was so zealous for and it wasn't even something that you know i decided i want to be a muslim you know my ancestors 1400 years ago decided we would be muslim and it's been passed in that kind of a chain right from from generation to generation for 1400 years. Like, who am I to say all these people were wrong about something? No way, I, I have too much faith and trust just in my own people and my own family, my own genealogy that, that we've been handed, I've been handed the truth and I have to stay firm and true no matter what anybody might, no matter what evidence somebody might claim that they can offer to, to sort of tempt me out of the, the faith of my fathers, like not gonna happen. And, and so my wife began to uh, intentionally intercede for me um, before the father and to mobilize many, 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 many people. Like I'm talking maybe tens of thousands is not an exaggeration of, mm -hmm. of Christ followers to take my name before the father and, and intercede for me. 
And when people began to do that, and I didn't even know that was happening, but as soon as people began to do that, that's when suddenly I was having these weird thoughts about what if I'm not good enough? What if, uh, what if I pray 10,000 times in my life and that's like means nothing to God? What if, you know, all these what ifs that I never would have dwelled on before were now just, I couldn't get them out of my head. And I would have these very specific statements that would just sort of drop into my heart. And I didn't know, like, why would I think such a thing? I later learned they were verses, like direct quotations from the Bible. No one had ever said them to me before. I'd never read the Bible, you know, become before becoming a follower of Jesus. I, I refused to read the Bible. Um, because I thought it was a corrupted work of, of human deception. Uh, and so, but I have these statements, you know, about, about my, my righteousness being like filthy rags, you know, something about my good works being like cleaning the outside of a cup when the inside is dirty and all these things. I'm just like, oh, why am I having, this is a weird thought for me to have. And I didn't know where it was coming from. I actually thought it might be satanic attack. So, so you're saying that um, before it worked, because this is about to get into to the good part, the, yeah. the the powerful part where something really shifted for you. But before that, basically what you're saying is that you came to America. Um, first, what what caused you initially to come to the U.S.? Well, we would visit the U.S. about every other summer um, okay. just to take a, a family vacation. My mom's originally from the States. Um, she was a, an American who converted to Islam um, before she married my father. And so she has family here in the US. And so every two years we'd go and visit them. And it just worked out that uh, the the summer we were here was the summer that Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Okay. And so basically your, your view of the West, your view of America probably in particular was was what explain explain what your view was and then like what your thoughts kind of were <laughs> that now yeah, you're very stuck negative in this place. view of the U.S. Uh, you know, growing up, we were told that the the two worst nations on the planet are the United States and Israel, and we called them the the big Satan and the little Satan. Wow, that's, that's what we thought about them. And yeah, you know, growing up, you know, and as someone who growing up as a as a child. Like we were going back and forth to the U.S. And there was everything I saw when we would visit the U.S. just confirmed what I was being taught back home in Saudi, um, which is America um, is full of, of violence, lawlessness, hedonism, materialism, godlessness, um, promoting sexual um, deviancy and promiscuity alcohol and alcohol abuse and drug use and abuse pornography like everything and, and that it seeped into their whole culture to the point that their movies are full of it their music is full of it um you know the fact that that they had you know had to put warnings and labels on movies and music like explicit lyrics or explicit content like we didn't have any of that in Saudi Arabia like they would, we wouldn't be allowed to, to view a movie that had explicit content in Saudi Arabia because it's not right. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't allow people to see this stuff or, or listen to this stuff is what I was taught. And so the fact that America mm -hmm. doesn't care. And then you combine that with every time I heard an American politician speak, they always, at some point we talk about America as a Christian nation. And they used to say that a lot more, by the way, in the seventies and eighties than they do today. But back then, like that right. was the thing we'd hear often, like America is a Christian nation. And so it's like, well, is it any wonder? Because clearly the Christians are the minions of Satan um, and their goal is to spread this, you know, Satanism, um, materialism all over the planet because they want, they want everybody to watch their movies and listen to their music and, and take on, you know, their, you know, form of government and their, you know, all of these freedoms that really what it to me, like American freedom was about giving people um, as much freedom as possible to sin and to promote mm -hmm. that, that like to encourage people to use that freedom to sin as much as possible. And that this was actually um, packaged, um, embedded in the Christian message itself. Because what I'd hear from Christians is, is whenever I would talk to them about sin, 
was, well, I don't have to worry about my sin because Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. So I can do whatever I want now and I'll go to heaven. Right. And I was like, uh, wow, you people are deceived. Yeah, right. Uh, which, which, by the way, is is the the same thing I get accused for teaching often uh, on this channel. Um, which, you know, in some ways, I think um, I, I some sometimes take that as a compliment because in Romans, Paul was accused of preaching the same thing as he preached the gospel because the gospel's so free. There is so much freedom. It is amazing the grace and just the the ease of it. But um, if you if you misunderstand it, you'll think that that equals a license to sin, which it does not. But uh, you, though, tied all that corruption and sin to Christianity, though, that you had that, oh, that totally. was sort of a link in your mind. So when you came to the U.S., you adopted somewhat of like a apologetic type mindset, right? Like you wanted to go and you wanted to win people over, yeah. convince I people actually, over I, to the truth of Islam. What happened was I started to make friends. <laughs> once once we were here, you know, and I didn't know how long we'd be stuck in the U.S., but, you know, we were, we were here long enough that, you know, we had to, you know, the summer ended, we had to get enrolled in school, you know, and so I started junior high, you know, here in the U.S., and uh, didn't know how long that was going to last, and I made friends. And obviously, I was the only Muslim in my school, completely. And, uh, and so nobody understood me, nobody understood my, my background, my, my perspective. And, and at first I thought, all oh, these poor infidels, they're all going to hell. And then as I started to make friends, I thought, well, you know, maybe they just need someone to tell them the truth. And, and then they'd at least have a chance, they'd have an opportunity. And then I started to think, maybe that's why I'm here. If God is sovereign, and he's plucked me out of my, my beloved nation of Saudi Arabia and has placed me now in the United States of America, maybe it's so that I could shine a light on the truth of Islam. And, and I genuinely wanted to see my, my closest friends become Muslim. And it just so happened that, you know, about half, I would say, of those closest friends were fairly devout followers of Jesus. <laughs> And so, so they were trying, out. <laughs> what I felt for them, they also felt for me. And so we were in this constant dance of, of getting into these, you know, friendly, mostly apologetic debates in junior high and then in high school, um, trying to prove to each trying to prove to the other that our religion was the right one. So you were basically on a mission to win these Christians over to Islam. Yeah. And and sometimes you might have not been successful, but I think you were successful in, in, in a lot of occasions, right? I was. Um, not with any what I would call like today call. I did back then. I didn't know the difference between like a lukewarm Christian, a devout follower of Jesus, someone who's um, just culturally Christian. Maybe they... Mm -hmm you know, grew up around in a Christian home, but never had a decision, made a decision for Christ themselves. And just an average atheist or agnostic American. To me, all of the above were Christians when I, back then, because mm -hmm. I thought yeah. if you're born in America, or if you grew up in America, you're a Christian because it's you're a raised Christian nation. It. In the same way that if you're born in Saudi Arabia or grow up in Saudi Arabia, you're a Muslim, obviously. Nobody asks you your religion. <laughs> if you tell yeah. them you're from Saudi Arabia, they already know you're a Muslim. And so I assume that all of my American friends were Christian. Um, the truth is the people that I led um, to Islam um, either, um, you know, came from some kind of Christian background, but they never, they never understood the gospel, you know, things in the Bible never made sense to them, or maybe they even never even had read the Bible for themselves. And so they were rejecting they weren't, they weren't rejecting the, the true gospel. They were rejecting whatever upbringing they had, rejecting, maybe some bad experiences they had with, with Christians um, or the church or whatever to choose to come to Islam, or they really didn't have any kind of strong religious background of any kind, more agnostic, whatever. And we're suddenly, you know, because I think a lot of people who are agnostic hope that maybe there is something, even if they can't know for sure or don't know for sure. And so when I would present Islam, I presented in such a way that, you know, this is, it's, it's rational, 
it's reasonable faith, it's logical, look at all the proof we have, and look at the scientific miracles in the Quran. How could, how could some caravan, you know, trader in Arabia 1400 years ago have known about the intricacies of the universe and, and right. how the planets revolve around the sun, right? Like, like nobody knew that back then. And so clearly Which, the Quran was from, it was divine revelation from God. And, and by the way, Muhammad, you know, this prophet was illiterate. And how could he have composed this beautiful, perfect, um, uh, poetic Arabic that has never been matched? Um, and by the way, you're funny. American. So you just have to take my word for it. The Arabic is top notch. Right. It's and that's, that's, it's funny because that's the exact same. I mean, I've, I, I can't count how many times I've heard that argument from Mormons sitting down with Mormons and they'll go, you know, they'll, they'll use that same line of, of argumentation about, you know, how could Joseph Smith written this, you know, he was just a child. Sure. He didn't have education and, and so yeah. on. So, yeah. 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 And you know, by the way, I just have to throw this in. I can't help it. Um, my answer to that today to anybody, whatever their religious background and they, they bring to me that their religious text has some kind of like crazy insight um, into the workings of the universe um, that no human could ever have figured out by themselves. Um, you know, first you have to ask, well, is that really the only way to read that text that you're pointing to? Are there right. other ways to read it that are maybe yeah. make more sense and maybe aren't quite as impressive? And then number two, if it really is without a doubt, some miraculous insight into mm -hmm. physical world, the natural world, whatever, do you believe in spiritual beings? Do you believe in angels? And do angels have any insight whatsoever into things that humans don't understand or haven't understood yet? And then number three, do you believe in fallen angels? And do they suddenly lose all that information when they decide right. to you right. know, rebel against the most high? And then yeah. hmm, maybe, maybe it did come from a supernatural source, but just right. because it's a mystery revealed doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, you know, like I'm not just trying to pick on even Mormons or, or any specific group, because I, I remember a time when I, as a Christian would, would sort of try to use the Bible in that same sense. You know, oh, yeah. I, I'd pull out passages from Job or Isaiah about, look, it says, you know, God hangs the, the, the circle of the earth hangs on nothing and things like that. Like that proves that, you know, the Bible had all this scientific knowledge right. and like i i don't i don't argue that way anymore <laughs> anymore um i don't Good job. i don't try to, to use that sort of <laughs> uh apologetic methodology anymore yeah. um because i think there there's there's some flaws in that but something i was curious about as you were you were and we're going to get here quickly to to the turning point for you but um did you ever come across any uh come across any christians who had good answers who like you would talk to and and you knew you knew how to defend islam like oh, you yeah. you you knew how to defend it and you knew probably how to make christianity christianity look pretty dumb to oh, the yeah. average the average christian but did you ever come across any that uh you feel like actually kind of gave you a run for your money um there were a, there were a few probably one or two like just through high school uh, friends of mine that they could at least like, we kind of like argue each other to a standstill. There were plenty that I felt like, and again, this is just, was my perception of it, that I just like destroyed all their arguments. <laughs> they had nothing to say, you know, for me it was case closed. And if they didn't become Muslim is because they were stubborn, you know, or, you know, foolish, whatever. Um, there wasn't anyone else, there wasn't anyone that I ever felt really stumped me though, or that I ever felt like I didn't have an answer. Now they may not have thought mm -hmm. my answer was as satisfactory <laughs> as I did, but I, I was satisfied. The The only person that really ever stumped me actually was my wife. Um, early on in our marriage, we're having these debates and she was always trying to pull, bring scripture into the discussion. And I always be like, no, no, that's out of bounds. You can't bring your Bible in because then I'm going to bring my Quran in and we don't, we don't accept, um, each other's books. And so it doesn't mean anything. You're appealing to an authority that I don't recognize. And so then she would get into, well, why don't you? Like, I mean, the Bible came first. Like, how can you reject what came before? And I said, mm -hmm. well, you know, the Bible's corrupted. 
it's been changed by people. You know, maybe at one time it was the word of God, but so many hands have, have meddled with the text that you can't know anymore what was original and what's what's been changed. And this was totally like, I've talked to my wife, Daisy, you know, since then about it many times. And this wasn't something like she pre-planned or thought about in advance, really just the Holy Spirit just brought this to her, uh, to her heart and then out of her mouth. She asked me, she's like, what, what percentage of the Bible do you think has been corrupted? Like, is it a hundred percent? Is it, is it 70%? Is it 50%, 30%? Like what percentage? And I was like, I don't like, no one ever asked me that before. And I was like, I don't know. Like maybe, maybe 30%, maybe 50%. I, you know, I really don't, I never thought about that before. And she then like, without missing a beat, she came back and said, even if like 90% of the Bible was corrupt, 100% of it is pointing to Christ as Lord and Savior. And so even if just 10% of it is true, that 10% still says the same thing that you're rejecting. Wow. So yeah. unless you believe 100% of the Bible is false, you can't throw it out. You can't, you can't dismiss its Christology. And I was like, I was stumped. I didn't know how to answer that because the only way I could refute that, because at first I thought, no, that can't be true. It can't be 100% of the Bible is pointing to Jesus. No way. I, I've never, I'd never heard that from anyone else um, before then. It sounded like, I don't believe it. I was skeptical that was true. But the only way I could prove her wrong would be, I'd have to pick this book up and read it for myself. And I didn't want to do that. So I just like, okay, right. I give up. I don't, let's, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to argue that anymore. And I stopped saying the Bible was corrupt at that point, because the only way I could move forward with that argument would be to read the text. And I did not want to risk see. opening the Bible. <laughs> and just, just to clarify for a lot of people who might not be aware, you as a Muslim did, uh, hold the Bible in a certain esteem, like you, the original, uh, text. I, I think the, the original, lost original text, right? <laughs> right. So the, so, the Quran talks about three books that came before the Torah right. of Moses, the Psalms of David and the gospel of Jesus. And so Moses came with a book and it was given to the people. The people rejected the message. They corrupted the text. Um, David came as a prophet with a book. He came with the Psalms to bring the Psalms to Israel. The, the, the message was rejected. The, the message was, was corrupted. Jesus came with a book. He brought this book called the gospel. And, mm -hmm. and that was his message. And the, he wrote, he, the, he wrote, and it was, it, it, it's been completely lost, right? Completely mm -hmm. like not even like, because what you look at, you know, the new Testament, where's the gospel of, I right. see gospel of, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where's gospel of Jesus? Where's the one that Jesus wrote? I would ask my Christian friends. And I said, well, there isn't one in there. And I'm like, ah, oh, see, you've lost it. That was the real gospel. Bring me the gospel of Jesus and I'll believe that. Interesting. <laughs> so so you, it wasn't that under Islam, you wholesale reject the Bible, you you guys esteem the Bible, you held it in, in high regard because it's mentioned in the Quran, but... Right. But the you, Bible you, you have just, today, we would say, is not the real Bible. Right. At which, best, it's a which, corruption of the original Bible. Which, again, is is a, a common strategy used by Christian cults, you know, who totally. want to form their own their own current doctrines. They'll They'll you know, eliminate the competition of the Bible by just saying it's corrupt. You know, you can't oh, corrupt. trust it. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you are on a mission, not only to convert others, but you wanted to convert your wife. You entered into that relationship. Oh, yeah. Now that's really, that's a personal thing right there. Right? It's not just like, Oh, I'd like my friend to go to heaven. Um, but this is like my, my bride, like, of course right. I want her, um, to inherit paradise and want her to believe the truth. And also just selfishly, I'm tired of arguing about religion all the time with her. Like, I just want her to be in unity with me. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, right after we got married, you know, she became pregnant with our, our first daughter. And it was like, man, I don't want to have to, because to me, it wasn't a question of what our children, like, even if my wife had remained Christian and I was Muslim, our children are going to be born Muslim. That's just how it works in, in my religion. 
And so, but I knew that was going to cause even more conflict in the marriage because she's going to want to take the kids to church or something at some point. And I'm going to be like, nah, not a chance over my dead body. And I can just, I could just imagine the future, you know, the future arguments that we were going to have over that. And so it's like, oh, I want to get her converted to Islam, you know, before any of our kids are, are at that age where that becomes um, uh, a conflict. So you were born in Saudi Arabia, born a Muslim, got trapped in the United States as a very zealous hardcore, you're going to go out and you're going to convert Christians. Um, I believe, I believe, um, you, you also, and maybe this was before, I think this was before you got trapped in America, but you were, you were one of those guys who in your mind, you wanted to die for oh, Islam, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that was kind I of was the ultimate. ultimate jihad. I was, you know, taught at a young age, you know, there's two paths to heaven. One is the path of, you know, do all the good works, as many good works as you can and hope that you've done enough to get in. Or option two, die as a martyr. And no matter what you've done in your life, golden ticket, you get to go to paradise automatically. Because God. So, promised. so that was with, with uh, the fear and the guilt and the the lack of assurance that you began to feel and your your status before God, um, that was just in your mind maybe like a an easy one way ticket, an easy way to know. Okay, oh, yeah. this is the route where I can have a, at least a little bit more confidence of where I yeah. would end up. I mean, if you had two two options to get somewhere that you really wanted to get to, and one had a seventy percent chance of success and the other one hundred percent chance, which one would you choose? Right. So, so you ended up getting trapped in America. You marry a Christian wife who you were not successful in converting. She begins praying for you, begins gathering thousands of other people that you don't even know. She doesn't even know to also begin praying for you. And then things begin to change. and, And you talk about that's when the 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 lack of assurance the the guilt or the fear mm-hmm. began right. to set the holy in. spirit was beginning to really move in my life and on me um i didn't know that i didn't have you know understand any of that uh, but that's what i was experiencing you know the conviction of my sin exposing uh, my my heart um before god um become have, uh developing kind of a heightened awareness um of you know the presence of god and that i wasn't living in the presence of god um but 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 having this ache this longing to be in his presence that um that there was something getting in the way that i couldn't i didn't know what it was i didn't know if it was me it was him like he was rejecting me or if there was something wrong or broken in me that was you know the reason but just uh, being aware of that being aware of that separation um uh, that was there, uh, between myself and God. And, oh, it was, it was depressing. It was frustrating. Uh, and it, and it brought me to this place of, of starting to suspect. And then as time went on, uh, cause this lasted about two years, um, uh, becoming more and more certain that I don't think I'm getting in. I don't think I'm, I don't think, uh, I'm going to end up in, in paradise or at least not, not right away. And that what I mean by that is, um, you know, there's a, a teaching in Islam that, you know, some Muslims who, who didn't, they didn't do enough to get in, will go to hell and they'll spend a certain amount of time in hell, like in the fire, skin melting off, all of that stuff, maybe, you know, for years, whatever, um, until God decides it's enough. And then he'll, release you out and then you'll be able to enter in um to paradise at that point but so i i was sort of sure like i don't know how much time i'm going to spend in hell but i think i'm probably going to i just like just started to feel that way Mm -hmm. um with greater and greater certainty and that was you talk about fear um you talk about um like sleepless nights like thinking about this this is a terrible thought to think about that i'm gonna die and I'm going to go into torment, like the most mm. horrific torment possible. And, um, 
you know, unlike the Bible, um, the Quran has a lot to say about torment and suffering in hell and just the gruesome tortures, like sadistic tortures um, of hell. Um, and it's, it's very scary stuff. So with all of your works, with all of your zeal, all of your prayers being kept at the right time, all of your good works, everything that you were doing. Yeah, I was still doing all the right things. <laughs> yeah. But boy, I sure didn't feel any security in them. It wasn't giving you peace. Not so, at all. so you didn't have any peace with God. None. From there, again, Daisy's praying. Your wife is praying for you. Um, tell us what happened. What happened to to cause you to go from that place where you're in this yeah. tormenting sort of fear of hell yeah. to where you are now? Well, it was uh, because I had reached that point where I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell one way or the other. Uh, and so almost this, that that's when I sort of fell into this. Well, you know what? If I miss a prayer, oh, well, like I started to can't, I started to care less about checking all the boxes every day. I like it didn't go out of my way. Like I didn't start drinking. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't decide to taste pork or anything like that. Like I didn't do any of the big stuff. Uh, and so, but you know, I started to do like the little, the little slip ups that a lot of my other Muslim friends like, Oh, I didn't get up early for the morning prayer. Oh, well, I'll, I'll pray an extra prayer tomorrow. Like that kind of stuff. Like I started to take it a little less seriously, a little less mm -hmm. zeal, for checking all the boxes. Um, and my wife invited me to come to church with her. And normally like never, like I'm not going to defile myself by walking to your satanic temple. Um, but I thought, you know, man, why not? Hey, I'm already going to hell. I'm real curious, like what they do in the church and what's that all about. And, you know, um, I know they, they, you know, eat flesh and drink blood in there. So I'm kind of curious what that looks like. Um, right. And, uh, so I said, fine, yes, I'll go, I'll go, I'll check it out. And, uh, not with any at all interest in exploring Christianity or thinking about becoming a Christian. Like I was already at this point, so convinced that Islam, that Christianity was false and Islam was true. It wasn't about that. It's just, well, I'm a Muslim who apparently isn't good enough. And so I might as well check out what these other people are doing because it's not going to hurt me one way or the other. Um, and I'm really secure in what I believe. So I go with her to church. Everything I see is just like confirming my, my worst suspicions that it's just all satanic <laughs> from beginning to end. Just, and just because, you know, especially like American church and especially like modern church, you know, all the elements that, that have been, that are there really to help people feel comfortable and welcome. To somebody right. from a Middle Eastern background, from an Islamic background, just look like you have no respect for what's holy. Um, you have no respect for, um, uh, you know, the uh, what it means to worship God and, and to do it in a holy way, in a set apart way. You know, you go into your sanctuary with your shoes on. You you eat donuts and drink coffee in in your holy building. Like, what in the world is it? A Dunkin' Donuts? Or is a place of worship and, you know, people making jokes with each other before or after the service and, you know, having, you know, hugging each other, like, you know, just behaving so informal. And for me, like worship, the worship experience and the coming to the mosque, you know, daily was about, it was all about formality. It was all about uh, solemnness and a, and a sobriety about, you know, this is, we need to come into this place with reverence. You know, what we do in this place matters. Like it's being, there's, there's, there's angelic beings that are paying attention to what happens right now. And so we don't want to take one step out of line while we do this. And I wasn't seeing that at church. I was seeing so much, you know, freedom. Mm -hmm. And I saw that freedom is just like a, um, a flippant, disrespectful attitude towards God. Uh, but I was drawn to something there. And I realized there was something about, this celebration that they were participating in. And that took me a while to get that, that it was really about, it was celebration that I was seeing. And I just was so, that idea of celebration and worship were, were two concepts that didn't 
connect for me ever before that moment that I didn't understand that you could celebrate in that way, almost like you'd celebrate a wedding mm -hmm. um, and do that with God and, and sort of anticipating God's presence in that activity, that God's somehow in some level in the room with you while you sing songs of praise and worship to him. I thought, wow, that's so audacious. Like, who do these people think they are that they think they matter that much to God, that he's going to listen to their, you know, off key singing, you know, he's got the universe to run. He's like, he's paying attention to you doing this. What? Um, but like I said, I was at the same time, I was thought it was silly, thought it was ridiculous, audacious, but I was also drawn like, wow, that's a crazy idea, but it'd be so amazing if it was true, wouldn't it? So you were sitting there and you ended up listening to this pastor. This pastor started preaching a sermon mm -hmm. and that's when. Yeah, I kind of figured happened? that they, they get a sermon every single week, like every week they get another sermon. And um, one Sunday he was preaching on, preaching a message and he was talking about the cross. And so I just immediately checked out. I found the cross so offensive as a Muslim. I didn't like to, to talk about it. I didn't like to think about it. Um, but I just felt something stir in me, you know, um, like what, what if it was true? What if somehow like these Christians think that what Jesus, that Jesus being crucified somehow makes all the difference in the world for them and for their lives. And so what if there is something to that? And I just don't understand it. Um, and, and what if that something was going to make all the difference for me? Am I, cause remember at this point, like I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell. Uh, and, and what if, there's something about in that story that's relevant to my situation. And I've just dismissed it out of hand because it doesn't make sense to me. I have all these questions. I think the Trinity is ridiculous and all of these things. I don't trust the reliability of this, of the text and all of that stuff. And yet what if it's somehow still true and who could prove that to me? What would it take for them to prove that to me? And I, I sort of landed on the conclusion that the only one, the only person I'd really trust in this would be God Himself. That I'm not, I'm not going to believe some, you know, you know, polite Christian pastor who, you know, I, I'd been at the, visiting the church long enough to kind of figure out how it works. Like, did you know, like, the church pays his salary? Did you know that the church pays his salary? So, what else is he going to say? Of course, he's going to preach. He's going to preach saying, say the Bible is true. Like he's getting paid to say this guys. Right. So mm -hmm. that was my mind. So uh, like, I'm not going to trust anything he says. He's biased. I'm not going to trust anybody in this building. They're biased. They grew up with this stuff. Most of them have never questioned any of it ever in their lives. Not like I have. And so I need God to confirm this message for me. And so if this is really the truth, then I was just thought, you know, God, show me, like, prove it to me. Give me some kind of sign, like anything to let me know that this, this gospel um, is, is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I didn't think there would be anything to that. I didn't think there'd be any response to that. You know, I didn't believe that God spoke to people still. I think, you know, God spoke to certain men um, in the ages before prophets, holy people. Um, I'm not a holy person. I'm not anyone special. I want God to give me a sign too bad for me because God's never going to do it. Um, but immediately when I sort of like said this, this almost faithless, just a little bit of faith prayer in my heart, like, please show me if this is true. I immediately um, had this very intense, very real, like it felt real to me, vision of Jesus being crucified and being, it was almost like I was present for that, that span of time that he was on the cross and, and just witnessing um, 
his 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 suffering, his pain, um, and ultimately, you know, the the sin of the world being placed on him, and him overcoming him uh, being victorious on that cross um, and victorious in his death over death. And, you know, there wasn't any, uh, like nobody was narrating it for me. It was all visual, but I was like, dots were connecting in my mind. Like it was just making sense to me. And I, and I was seeing as it was happening in front of me and I was understanding and I was understanding as I, as I looked into the face of this, you know, beaten and, and bloodied Jesus that I, I was somehow looking into the face of God and I was looking into the face of love and I was looking into the face of the one who knew me before I was ever born, the one who loves me and, and loved me all the way back then on the cross and man, that just broke me. And, you know, the, I, the vision for me ended with his death, but it also ended with this very real sense that I had, you know, well, almost as if he was speaking to me saying, you know, this is, this is the price I paid for you. I did this so that we could be in relationship together. Like we, you want relationship with me. I guess what? I want relationship with you. And this is what it took. To, to open the door for that. But now, so you've got to make the decision. The door's open, but you've got to make the decision to step in and, and to be a part of this, to accept the invitation. And, you know, I'd, I've been hanging out in the church for a few weeks. I kind of knew what that meant at that point, that it, it meant that I needed to confess with my lips, you know, that Jesus is Lord and, and to believe in my very heart uh, that God raised him from the dead, that he is alive, that he is reigning. Um, he is, he was not just, he was Lord. He is Lord. Um, and so I did that, um, right after that vision, um, experienced something very, what I felt was supernatural. Um, this presence that seemed to just fall upon me, this warmth, this amazing, like supernatural peace, um, feeling loved feeling accepted feeling like that hyper awareness i talked about that hyper awareness of like the presence of god oh it's so close but just out of reach like now it wasn't just close like it was under my skin like i had goosebumps like it was crazy like there's god is now with me right now and in, in, in this way i can't even describe i have no language for it and i just knew that something had changed like there had been a shift like like i would never be the same and uh and that's how I was born again. And then I spent a whole week trying to logic myself out of that whole weird supernatural experience. Like, no, there's no way that could be like, because I've been trained, I'm a Muslim. And, and like none of these things I saw in that vision, the Quran like refutes that any of that could have ever happened, but I saw it and it seems supernatural and it feels like it was coming from God. But if it contradicts my holy book, then maybe it came from Satan or maybe I'm just crazy. And it took me a week to realize that um, that love and that peace and that presence of God that I felt in that first moment had not gone anywhere. It was still there. And I don't think Satan can give you, you know, peace in your heart. I don't think Satan can make you suddenly like want to love your wife better, love your, your infant daughter better, suddenly like give you this sense of like, oh, like joy in the Lord. Like I just never experienced anything like this. Like Satan can't give you that. If this is what it means to be insane, that I guess I'm insane. I don't want to be sane. Uh, like, I don't, I don't want this to end. Um, but I'm pretty sure at this point that this experience was from God. And I thought, I realized, oh, no, I think I've become a Christian. Now what do I do for <laughs> the rest of my life? Oops. <laughs> wow. And I so, accidentally became a Christian. Yeah. So you prayed this prayer and God answered in in a real powerful way and, and yeah. that doesn't happen that doesn't happen for everybody um, no it happens a lot for muslims yeah actually um not That's as much as pe people kind of exaggerate the numbers a little bit mm -hmm. it's not like a hundred percent it's but it's more like 60 percent 60 mm -hmm. to 70 percent 
um, of Muslims um, that have experience have some kind of vision, vision of Jesus, supernatural encounters, yep. something like that. Yeah. Yep. But it's always, and I want so, to be real about this. It's always also though, almost always in combination with uh, a very present, very real, physical, personal Christian witness in their lives. You mean so like like there's Christians around them who have shared the gospel that, that are they, sharing. They, yeah, they, they somehow gotten a hold of a Bible and have a chance to start reading it or whatever. And so that the vision or dream comes to help confirm, or sometimes the dream precedes the the Christian witness that comes later that helps confirm the dream. Because that when that when the dream comes first, usually Muslims will say, "I don't understand why do I keep having dreams about Jesus. Like, what is this about? Why why do I keep seeing Jesus like this?" And then, yep. you know, God brings a believer into their life that, that usually shares with them. That, that's usually how it, how it goes in my experience. Okay. So God does do that. And it doesn't yeah. happen with everybody, but it happened, happened with you where you yeah. asked for, for him to show you what was true. And, um, and he did. He showed you something right. that, like he said, changed your life. And people can argue all day about, you know, like, like, like you argued probably with yourself about, was that a psychological, oh, yeah. uh, you know, th- but but people did the it day, me, oh, Satan gave you that vision to tempt you away. To still today. Really yeah, can. sure. I, and I've, right. I, yeah, I don't want to say, who, but uh, it's changed your life. It's changed who you are. And, 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 and like you has. said, oh, yeah. oh yeah. took you and from, people, a, like some uh, of those friends I mentioned, those friends in high school, um, that I've been reunited with, um, over the years, who knew me when I was Muslim? Well, mm-hmm. would if yeah, if they were here on this call, like they would say, yeah, the Nasser you see today before you is not the Nasser from thirty years ago. Yeah, he's not the same person. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't really, um, I can't really imagine a a mean, hateful, self righteous Nasser. It's hard to hard to I imagine. <laughs> yeah, but you, yeah, but my you wife can. can. She can tell you. Yeah. Those first few years of our marriage were hard. They were brutal. So after you were born again, you had this uh, this moment where you were convinced that that all this Christianity stuff that you'd spent a lifetime thinking was a bunch of demonic, you know, garbage, to in a moment being completely convicted and convinced of who Jesus was. Um so that was something that didn't go over well with your family, right? Of course. Like, how could it? How could it? Um, you know, if, if that's your view of Christianity and, you know, you're, like I said, coming from a culture and a background that is spiritually homogenous, like everybody believes the same thing. Like the, your belief is part of like, what, what marks you as a member of the community. It's what unites all of us together. And to say, I don't believe this anymore is the same thing as saying, we're no longer family anymore. Mm. You know, I want to change. Like, imagine if one of your children said to you, you know, dad, um, actually, I don't want to call you dad anymore. I'm going to call you Jordan. And I'm going to change my last name, like one of your sons. So I want to be associated with you. I don't want anyone to know that we have any kind of relationship anymore. Like I want to be complete. I want to have it tattooed on my body has nothing to do with Jordan Hatfield. How would you feel? Mm. And that's what that hurt. Muslim parents feel when their sons yeah. and daughters say, I've decided to follow Jesus. They don't think, Oh, well, good for you. Or, well, you know, everybody should choose their own religion. Like they don't think that they think like, like you've just stabbed them in the heart and you've brought shame in an, in an honor, shame culture you brought shame on your family, on your parents, on your siblings. If you come from a, a noteworthy tribe, you brought it, you know, on, on the, your clan. Right? It's, it just goes on and on. Like there's all this social damage that just ripples outward from this one choice that you've made. In some places, it can mean the only way to cover up that shame is with the spilling of blood. And so this person who has shamed the family has to be put to death. And it's not that, you know, your family members are excited about that. Like they, with tears in their eyes, they stone or they slip, you know, the throat of their sons and daughters, because this is the only way now to atone for the shame. And some really extreme places, 
Like the whole family's got to be killed now. So I actually know a sister in Christ who, when word got out that she had decided to follow Jesus, her mother wept and said, you killed us all because her whole family, whole extended family was going to be murdered by their neighbors back home because of this one person had committed treason by leaving Islam. It's a huge deal. And not, yeah. I wasn't looking forward to, I, I, I was up until the very last moment debating how I could like keep this a secret and just not tell anyone that I become, let everyone continue to think I'm a Muslim and just not make any waves. But unfortunately, my wife didn't understand any of the nuances because still newly married, cross-cultural marriage, didn't quite get everything yet. And she didn't understand the ramifications when she began. As soon as I told her that I was born again, she immediately you know, told her family, told friends, told the church, right? Because I, I didn't know they were all praying for me. And, and so she wanted to let them know, like, praise Jesus, like this happened. And, and so then the word was out. And so then I kind of was forced, like my hand was forced. I have to tell my family. They can't find out from a rumor. Um, I either have to tell them or I'm going to have to continually deny Christ over and over and over again. When they ask me, is this true? I heard you became Christian. And I didn't want to do that. How can I do that? I've, after seeing what I saw, he went through for me. I'm going to deny him. I'm going to deny that that was real. Deny that he did that for me. I can't do that. So I have to confess. And so I confess um, to my youngest sister. Um, her response was she made the decision she wanted to follow Jesus. Actually, she'd already made the decision, but she was so terrified of her jihadist older brother and what he might do to her <laughs> if she left the faith um, because of which was you. Was so and she, I, yeah, she I was, was the scary guy. I was the scary guy in the family. And she and had already become is, is Jesus follower now. So now the door is open. <laughs> yeah. Right, I can come to Jesus. So your younger sister before you had become a believer, she was already, oh, yeah. she had already my, made a decision. My sneaky wife was faith. like evangelizing my younger siblings <laughs> behind okay. my back, like this whole time. And so but it, it really took hold, you know, for my sister, like she just really loved what she saw in Jesus um, and how, how Jesus in the Bible speaks to women and treats women um, really. But she was afraid of, of how you would respond to that. Yeah. She's afraid of this guy. She's afraid of you. That, that I, I might kill her. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Who knows? God only knows what I would have done if she had, while well, I was still a Muslim, left the faith. But it wouldn't have been pretty. I can tell you that. Um, and so then I shared with one of my brothers. Um, he was really shocked. Um, we had a really intense, but a good, like, conversation about it. Um, he brought up all of the same nagging questions I had at that time. Okay, Nasser, if all this is true, what do we do with the Quran? Because Quran says what you saw didn't happen. So is the Quran not from God? Or is it just those verses from the Quran aren't trustworthy? Or we've misunderstood them? Like, what do we do with it? And, and if the Quran, if there's problems with the Quran, and Muhammad is the, the messenger who, who brought us the Quran from God, is Muhammad still a prophet? <laughs> if you brought a false message, is he still a prophet? Or what is that? You know, what do we do with that? Mm. Um, and like I said, like those were still nagging me at that point. Those 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 questions had not been resolved for me yet. And and I told them, I was honest. I was like, I don't know. All I know for sure um, is Christ and him crucified. That's it. I hadn't actually read that in Corinthians yet. But it's yeah. just what came out of my mouth. Because that's, and it was true. That's really all I knew. And I told him, I said, I think, Based on my experience, that's all you need to know to say yes. That's that's what you have to say yes to. And I said, I think, I guess we just have to figure out the rest of it as we go. And and he decided, thought about it, and he decided that was good enough for him to take the first step. And so he chose to follow Christ as well. Um, and the whole rest of my family, unfortunately, either thought I was insane, that I would had been brainwashed by my Christian wife, or, you know, yeah, or it was demonized, something. Like there's something something horribly wrong happened in Nasser. Um, and for the most part, it was just completely um, rejected and disowned um, by a good chunk of my family. And uh, after being given by my father, I like a, a, a little bit of time to repent. Um, and then we could just kind of cover over this and pretend it didn't happen. Um, was basically told like, yeah, like you're dead to me. Don't 
ever come home. Wow. So your, your decision to follow Jesus came with some consequences. Pretty heavy consequences, which is coming from a, um, a Muslim background, like other, this is common. This is, this is the common story you'll find. You talk mm -hmm. to anyone um, who has, who has left Islam for anything, even if it's just to be a, like, you know, an atheist or something. Um, yeah, like this, uh, the, the, the co cost in relationships um, is very, very high. Yeah. So now where you're at, able to kind of look at God as you see him now. Yeah. So we're 25 God years as you used from, to that, see him. from that point. 25 years from that point. So what, what is the difference between, and obviously there's a lot, <laughs> but, but maybe just uh, like, as you see it, just a quick, what, what would you say is the, the core difference between what you see in the God of Islam? And I think the, the God of, of many religions, but, but Islam in particular right now, and the God that you've come to know now, what is it about the God that you know now that is different, that, that makes you want to continue to follow him and allows you to have peace? Um, yeah, I, I generally um, will talk about it um, from the standpoint of, of the God of the Bible, because, you know, there's a lot of religions that say God and, you know, call God, God, mm -hmm. which God are you talking about? So the God, also the God of the Bible and then the God of the Quran. So you have these two books that talk about one God and describe his attributes, his character, his nature. And there's a lot of actually, there's a lot of similarities. There's probably more similarities than there are differences, but the differences are stark um, and significant. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest differences is that the God of the Bible is personal. He's a person. Um, he is a God of community and relationship and desires intimate partnership with human beings. And the narrative of the Bible is such that this is exactly what we, we were created for is relationship and partnership with God, which is very different from Islam where human beings were created to be servants and worshipers of God. Um, and God is impersonal. God is so transcendent in Islam. It's unthinkable that um, you could have a personal kind of face-to-face -face relationship with him, even to the point that in the, in the, uh, the coming age after the judgment and, and people are assigned their places in eternity, that there will be even in heaven, this sort of hierarchy of levels within paradise with God at the very top and sort of the people that just barely made it in on the very bottom and everyone else kind of in between according to their works. But even the most pious, even Muhammad himself doesn't live on the level where God lives. Like God still, there's a separation between humans and God, even in paradise, because he's just not available for that and doesn't desire that. Like he, it's not, there's nothing in him that wants that. Um, there's no verse in the Quran about God. Like there's verses talking about, you know, sort of like God being kind of loving to those he wants to show love to. Um, but there's no verse that God is love. Like literally he's the definition of love um, is not in there. Um, there's no, there's no language. There's no relational language in the Quran when it talks about God. There's no God as father. There's no talk as of God as bridegroom. Like, oh, that would actually be blasphemous to talk about God mm -hmm. um, in, in either of those senses, but especially the second, because um, it just implies such a, 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 a deep intimacy. It's just, yeah. you know, um, not, not appropriate in the, in the, worldview of the the god of the quran um, and these are significant things i mean for me because i i can't imagine anymore um how in the world i could get through this crazy life and i mean all the stuff that we're seeing in the world today 
if I wasn't able to walk through these things and, and I've experienced my family and, you know, um, brother, you know, we've experienced our share of suffering and, um, and I've experienced my fair share of persecution. Um, I don't know how I'd walk through that without God being with me. Not just him being my God, not just him being for me, but him being with me is such a big deal. And that is, I think, a unique uh, attribute of the Christian mm-hmm. faith is that is that God wants to dwell with us and in us. And that we could somehow, as imperfect and and sometimes very broken vessels, um, still be counted worthy by him, by what he's done for us um, to partner with us in such a way. Like, it just blows my mind. Um, I think the Christian life is the best life on planet Earth. And... I've heard people say that who have experienced the worst atrocities you can imagine. People that have been, um, had their lives taken from them by groups like ISIS. And yet with tears in their eyes, they can raise their hands up in the air and praise God for he is good and his love endures forever. That they can raise their hands up and say, let the redeemed say so, like what you started us with um, today. Mm-hmm. Um, and people I mean, they have suffered a thousand times more than I ever have. And they can say that life with God in and through Christ Jesus is the best life that any of us could ever have. And that this life is available for each one of us right now. Like the door is already open. Like all you have to do is say yes to that invitation. You come in to bow the knee before Lord Jesus. And, and in, acknowledging him and coming under him as Lord, you suddenly find like, wow, like what an upside down kingdom where the king, the king serves his subjects. The king is willing to become like a slave and die a slave's death to set his subjects free. Like, it's just amazing. Hmm. Which that, that, that does a good job. I was going to ask a, uh, a secondary question to that, but I think that kind of answers that. My question was going to be, what what makes Christianity, Jesus, and the gospel unique amongst other religions it, from your perspective, having been another okay. one? And that's that just that simple point that that the God we serve, the the Lord that we follow, it is is one who isn't this distant. You know, that's a big part of what you said. He's not just this distant, far off angry, condemning, judgmental, just waiting for us to do something wrong. But actually he sees us in the junk and the mess of where we're at. And he humbles himself. It's Philippians two. He, he, though he exists in the form of God, he doesn't consider that something to cling on to, but because of his love and goodness lays that aside, becomes like us, takes the form of a servant. Again, is what Philippians two says. And, dies on the cross um that that's a god who who you know as you're talking about in times of suffering in times of trials uh times of doubt and confusion what whatever emotions whatever difficulties fill in the blank there with whatever uh whatever plagues you as a human being we all have have junk and some more than others but that's that's a god who will give you comfort. That's, that's a God who is, and, 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 and I don't think it's just emotionalism either. I think it's something, something that God is willing to, to speak to us in a very real way. Absolutely. Um, he, he's willing to, to move in our lives and, and it, yeah. And so, so all that to say, you kind of answered my, my other question, but to kind of wrap this up, I, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, there's a, a lot of people, you know, again, a lot of why I wanted to do this interview is is just hopefully to to 
a big part of it was to give a lot of these members coming out of this mother God cult, just right. kind of another perspective and so, somebody who can relate to them that, sure. that um, is coming from this perspective. But so much of your school story is wrapped up in this, this contrast between a works-based sort of relationship with God and one that is grace. So yeah. just very quickly, there's so many people that uh, whether whether it's in this specific cult group that we often deal with or or others, that that's that's it right there. Like like that's yeah. that's what matters, and that that's what again th I think the human tendency is uh, in the Garden of Eden. Again, going back to Genesis, we, what, which is another thing we started with. There were two the two trees. There's a tree of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and human beings, you know, God didn't just want human beings to not eat from the, from the knowledge of evil. He didn't want them to just not do bad things. He didn't want them to, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good. Uh, there's so much more to, to that. To define good and evil for themselves. To define good and evil for themselves. And, and I think that's what so many religions do. That's exactly what right. we as human beings get wrapped up in is, is defining what is good and evil for ourselves uh, in an attempt to make God happy with us, in an attempt to become something that right. hopefully God will accept. So sure. with with people in mind that are caught in that mindset, that 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 would look like somebody like you and me, even today, there, there's people in this group who would look at somebody like you and me and what they'd see is, oh, you guys are, you know, you don't keep the Sabbath on Saturday. You, you're not keeping the Passover according to the old covenant law. You know, that's, I keep the that's Sabbath a big on thing Saturday. for you. So there you go. <laughs> but I guarantee you do so, you don't do it the right way is what they're sure. saying. <laughs> sure. But but, but, but what just, I would argue and I think with where you're going with this and I, yeah. I'm familiar enough with this group because I've actually spoken to members of it before. Um right. Might randomly that have approached me out in public. Um I, I know that they um they they still use the Bible try to justify right. a lot of things and to justify that kind of worldview and i can tell you that that's not the story and all the way back from the very beginning to the very end of the book it is a consistent narrative that re-emphasizes over and over again god's grace and mercy towards us our our um fallibility and yet god's kindness and patience in the face of that and the significance of faith and that it is only by faith or trusting trusting god that if he mm. said something he's gonna do it like it's gonna happen um trusting his word trusting what he has spoken uh, is over and over again what uh, makes anyone in this story justified or that is to say declared righteous or in right relationship with him it's consistent and i'm talking from the very first beginning page it's not a new co testament concept anything like that and um I, I i i'm so discouraged sometimes you know when i see even christians who don't understand that and who talk about and you know i think this creates opportunity and space for for cult groups to come in and and try to subvert the narrative when Christians don't understand the Old Testament, when they think that somehow the Jews were trying to earn their salvation, and then Jesus and Paul came and like helped them mm -hmm. like try to fix that, like that was not what Judaism has ever taught, um, and and that's not the message in the Torah. It's not the message in the prophets. It's not the message in, in the, the Hebrew writings. Um, and so I I try to do my best to try to educate or reintroduce. Um, Western Christians to the very Middle Eastern, very Jewish roots um, of the, the Holy Scriptures. Um, and I would, I would encourage people that feel like they have been, are, are confused about the narrative or don't understand how it all makes sense, to be just be willing to humble themselves and, and look again from a different lens. And to realize that you can read all kinds of things in the text that aren't there if you approach it with the wrong lens. Um, and, and unfortunately, if you don't like to study or don't like to learn anything, it can be a little hard because it means you've got to learn 
some context. You've got to understand um, a little bit of, you know, what was going on and what what uh, what life was like, and in the Middle East five thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, um, to help you understand um, the culture and the context the scriptures were speaking to primarily. In other words, at first, and yeah, it still you know applies to us. But um, if you don't do that, you're going to misapply so many things and misunderstand so many things both in the new testament and in in the old testament um but yeah again that's why i i've really committed my life to to studying the word and teaching the word and teaching the word from the right lens using the the correct you know context and that that sets up well for you know what i wanted to do here to to kind of wrap up is to point people to your youtube channel because i am getting uh, over the past year or so, I'm getting a lot of questions about, you know, um, well, I won't say a lot, but I've gotten consistent questions about where, you know, where we've left this group, we've left this cult group now, where do we, where do we go? You know, what church to go to, um, what Bible teachers would you recommend and stuff? And so a uh, big reason why I've been wanting to get Nostra on is because I want to um, encourage you guys to go over to his channel check out his stuff. You're going through, what book are you going through right now? Um, we are, we just finished Matthew chapter 11. So we're almost, almost halfway through the book of, of Matthew. Okay. So Nasser is going chapter by chapter through, through specific verse. books. Yeah. And yeah. I started in John in 2019, spent about nine months going through John. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, we took a little break and then a pandemic global pandemic happened and it was in person before then, but we managed to videotape most of John um, and have audio of all of it there on YouTube. And then when the pandemic happened, I've just been kind of following the leading of the Lord. And so he had me go through Esther and then Daniel um, and then Ezra Nehemiah. And then we've now jumped into Matthew and that's where we find ourselves now where we go after Matthew. I don't know. I kind of like to go back to the beginning, go back to Genesis. I think a lot of people Mm -hmm. would love me to tackle revelation next but you know we'll just see how the look leads. <laughs> good luck with that um <laughs> yeah there's a lot of people who would who would uh again referring to the the wmscog they would they would appreciate that it'd be interesting actually to hear some of your take on it um sure but but yeah i would i would suggest to people to go check check that out because like you said you offer a a middle eastern context sort of in, yeah. in the way you um uh, approach what I, grew up in, the what I know you give yeah. right so it, it's you kind of have a a, a one-up on us in in that way and in, in, in the sense that you can you can understand so much more the stories yeah. the relational aspects the totally. certain certain things that probably are completely wacko and wacky to us <laughs> in the right. west are like well that's yeah that makes sense and so so uh yeah i <clears throat> i would recommend um to those of you, especially who've asked for for a Bible teacher that I'd recommend, here's one that I would I would commend to you to go uh, watch some of his stuff. So, um, with that said, Nasser, um, yeah, do you have do you have any last words, any last thoughts? I, I guess what's in my heart that I just can't get out of is just any any last things you'd say to to people who are you know who are confused about God and who are maybe just even, even tempted to just completely abandon faith. You know, they, they've tried out this religious stuff, whether it's coming out of Islam, whether it's coming out of a cult group. And they're like, you know, either they're in this mentality of, of I'm just giving up because I feel so condemned or, or I don't even believe in God anymore. And I don't, I, you know, I don't just don't even believe in this faith stuff. What, that that's a broad scope there, but just kind of a last, last word to people like that. Yeah, I empathize with people who have been burned um, on religious things and religious systems and even trusting people that claim this. I mean, like if you're if you've been listening to Jordan and I and you're still like, who are these guys? Like, I get it. Right. Who are we? Um, I, I will tell you that that we're sincere. We both believe that that we, we know the truth. We're in the truth. But let's be fair. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're deluded. But I'll, I'll tell you what what has never what didn't fail me and was, was never failed anyone that I know who was sincere and seeking truth. And that's the important part, because I don't think this is going to work. If you really don't want to know the truth, 
like the Lord's just not going to shove it in your face. He's not going to force you. Um, and he's not going to force your hand. He's not going to grab you and, and, and pull you into something that you don't want to be a part of. He's going to invite you. Um, and he's going to be kind about it. He's going to be gentle about it. Um, but you've got to say yes to that invitation. And I think if, if you're starting in a place where you don't know, you're just seeking, that's okay. You know, Jesus, Jesus has good things to say about those who just want to start by, by just seeking, by, by maybe even knocking on a few doors. And I would encourage you to, as crazy as it may sound, I don't know your background, but just you know, get in a, in a quiet place, in a private place. Don't feel like there's any, anyone watching or judging you. And just speak to God as if he was right there in the room and just confess whatever it is, your frustrations, your confusion, if you've got bitterness, disappointment, whatever it may be, with, with all that you've experienced thus far in your life, just confess that to him. Even if you're like, confess that you're mad at him, that he's let you down in your mind, that you ended up in this group or that group or believing this or believing that or whatever, like just mm. confess that all to him. And then just ask him sincerely, to lead you into truth, to show you, to um, confirm to you what is true because you want to walk in. And I promise you, he's, he's going to answer in his own way. I don't know. I can't promise he's going to answer with a vision or a dream or that there's an angel is going to show up in the room. Like he can do whatever he wants. He's God. But I, I can't promise you he will be, he will answer that prayer. He will because he's faithful and he's good. And that's why you can trust him. That's why you can give him your life. You can surrender your will to him, your dreams to him, your hopes to him. That can sound awful if you're doing that to a dictator or a tyrant. But he's the most loving, wonderful being in the universe. And he is fully and completely trustworthy, faithful, loving, merciful, compassionate, and so, so patient with us. And so he's be so, so patient with you. So just be willing to humble yourself and ask him. Ask him to guide you and lead you, and he will. That's good. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so thank you, Nasser. Thank, thank you, you so it. much for coming on. And, for and um, me. I will I will put links to Nasser's YouTube channel in the, the video description so you can check that out. So thank you so much. Yeah. Nasser, you have a great night. Um, you too, brother. And hopefully, we'll hopefully we can hang out soon and, and yeah, uh, talk about good. Star Wars. Talk about Star Wars and <laughs> yeah, Mandalorian. That's, that's and all kinds. One of, of one of the core things that knits me and Nasser together is, is both our love and our frustrations with with the Star Wars series. It. So yeah. <laughs> got to take the the good with the bad, right? Yep. Right. Right. There, there's there's was more bad in the Star Wars stuff up until the Mandalorian. <laughs> and now it's kind of. But that, that's Disney Plus a, is somehow dig- redeeming it. All right. <laughs> that's a digression, but it is. we'll end with that. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And, and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.